track team, we're proud we got our track nation. Today we got the VIP Drag Nation event for Trax Denver Mega Pride Celebration Weekend featuring Evie Oddly, Vanessa Vanji Mateo, and Silky Nutmeg Ganache. It's uh, already sold out and it's a, a really good party. As you can tell, anytime there's a unicorn on stilts, it's a good time. It's actually a dream come true to be back home. Um, I've been, I've been on the road for quite a while, and so it just really feels special and full circle to come back home for Pride and, and just see all the people who helped me get to where I'm at and give them absolutely no credit. <laughs> Despite the fact that I don't do what everybody has always done, Denver was really loving and embracing of my drag and lifted me up, even even though I didn't fit into like what, what they're used to. So it was the first taste of um, somebody appreciating my art, even, even though it's really out there sometimes. And sometimes I'm just a basic, beautiful lady. <laughs> I've always had... Uh, a few mentors here who kind of helped me come into my own and push the art a little bit more and supported me even when the others didn't get it. <laughs> I would say Pride Everywhere is such a special thing because uh, it's a way of celebrating queer history, queer expression, and exactly 50 years ago was the sort of original moment in history where Pride began to be a movement uh, in our culture. And if you look at where we're at now, it's extremely beautiful, the fact that not only has, has queer culture become accepted, but it's become celebrated. I always start my makeup differently almost every single time that I put my makeup on. I want to go for a more dramatic, kind of clowny look. On average, I would say that my face takes anywhere from an hour to two hours to do. But it also depends on what kind of face. When I do something a little bit more natural, more blended, I can do my face in anywhere from, you know, 30 minutes to 45 minutes or, or quicker. Um, but when I do something a little bit more intense, it takes longer amount of time because I want the precision to be there and I'm most likely working with different colors or shapes. I've been doing drag, it'll be six years in July. Uh, drag has kind of evolved a lot just within the six years that I've participated in it. I appreciate the Denver drag scene because we are a huge pool of expressive artists, whether that be vocally, performances, we're a very creative city. Um, we're getting to a place where we're learning to accept everybody and promote everybody's accomplishments and goals and really show that community support. Like every venue in town caters to specific audiences and really is there genuinely for the community and um, provides a space for everyone, at least, at least any kind of certain people to feel like they're in a safe place. I mean, I obviously wasn't around in the drag scene or even in the queer scene 15, 20 years ago, but when talking to some of the legends that helped create drag, uh, a little bit more accepting here and, you know, uh, did a lot of the work, paved a lot of the ways for us to be able to go out to bars or uh, walk around town and be in drag and stuff. It's just amazing to me to think uh, what kinds of things the queens had to go through or entertainers had to go through just to perform. It makes me very thankful that we're good for what we have and what we're able to do. I was raised in performing drag. You worked live, you did your own singing, you did your own you know, choreography, your own comedy stuff, all that was live. Now it's off of a record or off a tape or a CD. I have done drag since 1963 and I am now 81. Female impersonation for me was when you look real. Now some of the the kids who do drag today look fabulous. They have spectacular makeup. They look like a, a, a stage girl. To me, when I was taught to do drag was to look like a real woman. In 1959, I moved here my, for the first time. Then shows were very unusual. 
Today it's so free, they can pretty much do anything they want and they have no concept of how difficult it used to be to do drag. They could technically arrest you for leaving the stage. The charge was appearing in public in the clothing of the opposite sex. You could wear a costume or a dress on Halloween, a man could. But you also had to wear three articles of male clothing underneath of it. And you could not be in a dress one minute after the stroke of midnight. The police would back their paddy wagon up to the door of the two gay bars we had that was called the Beachman and the Pit. You stepped toe outside that door in a dress, you immediately got arrested and went to jail. It was specifically directed at, at the gay community. They would come into the show and, and stand in the audience, you know, watch you. If we wanted to use the men's room, we had to take everything off except our makeup, get dressed as a boy, go across the hall to go to the, use the bathroom, come back and put everything back on again. I mean, today you can see a drag show every day of the week. You can walk to any store, any nightclub, any restaurant in drag, no one bats an eye anymore. They don't, they don't care. We essentially created a space where not simply did no one care, but people valued you for who you are. In fact, they loved you for being different. So drag as any cultural practice has changed and proliferated, and I think the word we want to use is flourished. Female impersonation versus cross-dressing versus drag. Drag has so many different forms, it's almost individual to the actor and to the performer. I'm a teacher by training, but I'm also like a historian at my heart. I started going through card catalogs and I started looking online and it took me many years, almost 10 years now, in the basement of this place called The Steakhouse. That was the first gay bar in Denver in 1933, called The Pit. So the nucleus of the gay community existed right about here, around World War II, and all the way out to Cheeseman Park. Starting in about 1950, we started to get things like McCarthyism and uh, crackdowns on communism in the United States. This eventually leads to a period of time known as the Lavender Scare, in which hundreds of people are um, kicked out of the United States government for being gay. In Denver, uh, they actually banned drag in 1954 by city ordinance. So Denver was taking its cues from Washington, D.C. What this meant was that the city, in order to make itself appear more appealing to defense spending dollars, which were increasing exponentially at that point, they had to do a lot of things like keep crime off the streets. They took an old ordinance dating from 1886 designed to clean up the streets uh, of, from prostitution because prostitutes in the late 19th century used to cross-dress to advertise their services. And they, instead of making it anyone in public caught appearing in a, in, in a dress not belonging to their sex, they made it men. So these ordinances were passed in 41 American cities between 1843 and 1974. Essentially what they did was they tried to crack down on prostitution, but they began to be used more and more uh, against the LGBTQ community. They would be taken to jail, they'd be booked, they'd get a criminal record, and then if they were outed at their jobs or in their public life, they could be I mean, they could basically lose everything. So the higher one's status, the more one had to lose. So there was a lot more closetedness. The Stonewall Riots were a series of riots after a raid on a, a gay bar in New York called the Stonewall Inn. It happened in June of 1969. After Stonewall, everything changed. The riots themselves were basically uh, a couple of nights where the police were trapped in, in the Stonewall Bar, and this eventually led to the first gay pride. After that, you get the creation of the Imperial Court of the Rocky Mountain Empire, and drag really becomes central to the period known as gay liberation. These emperors and empresses and these monarchs, as they're called, create visibility for the LGBTQ community. In the 1970s, if you wanted a form of entertainment, the court was the place to go. So the ordinance was actually defeated in 1973. So the writing was kind of on the wall that that form of harassment was, uh, was coming to an end. Denver, after 2000, was growing by leaps and bounds. We had gone through something called Amendment 2, which was an anti-gay ordinance. We had gone through HIV. We had gone through so many battles that this was a period not of quietude, but of renaissance. You know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, obviously I'm, a, I'm a, a, a gay man, and why am I wanting to dress as a woman? I did it because there was an opportunity to, um, to fundraise in a different way. You know, the great thing about the the drag community is we really raise money, you know, one dollar at a time. 
Denver's Got Talent. I mean, I think the, the least amount of money we raised was 10,000 in one night and the most was 18,000. And that's for a drag show. Luscious Laurel is my drag persona. I call her my cousin. I've been doing drag for, um, what, 17 years? Wow, that's a really long time. So I've been Miss Colorado Gay Rodeo Association. Um, I've, I'm Empress 40 of the Imperial Court of the Rocky Mountain Empire. It's just being out, you know, being visible, being supportive, um, and just, I think, trying to make a difference in a different way. All right. In 2000, I ended up organizing my first uh, Pride Fest parade. Uh, back then, it was a lot smaller, um, maybe 100 entries. Um, this year is 240. It's the largest parade uh, in my 19 years. So right now we're actually lining up the parade. Oh, the Denver Cyclist Sluts are back. Uh, what? Yay. And so basically what we do is you, we go through each parade application. We put down their name. Um, are they going to march? Are they going to have music? Um, and then we just put it on a sticky. Denver Gay Men's Chorus. We laid out 240 stickies. I mean, it's really high level organization happening right now. <laughs> Next year, my 20th year, will be my last parade. I think 20 years is plenty. Sometimes, you know how it is when you have your favorite outfit, and just I'm just gonna put this on just because it's fun. Um, so there are a few like that that just you put them on and you just feel like that MC star person. When I started hosting Pride Fest, um, I. Uh, was working with drag queens who were always so very fabulous in their presentation and I thought I needed to compete with that. See how the waist visually slims a little more? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's what we're gonna do. I wanted them to be flashy. I wanted them to be able to compete with what the drag queens were wearing. That was always important to me. We're just gonna um, bias bind everything. But when we got to Pride Fest, and I was like, this is a big stage, I need to go big like Diana Ross would, that's when we got more elaborate and started drawing concepts. And then the other thing we're gonna do on this one so that it's not as difficult to get into is we're gonna go ahead and yes. open up the seam and put in a separating zipper. Thank you, perfect. I work with the Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design, and so sometimes the students uh, get to uh, draw what they want the outfit to look like, um, which can be very interesting because they really challenge me to think outside of the box. There are some things that are avant-garde in the fashion world that I simply would not wear. Um, I don't like to show nipple or too much. I like to be, I always say when I'm on stage, I want people to wonder what it would look like if he took more off versus someone to look at me and say, I wish he would put more on. So again, I, I believe there, you can have a sexy look uh, without just being tacky. I am pleasantly surprised. Well, I am too. <laughs> <laughs> I never felt like that my personality changed when I put on something. I would watch the drag queens. They would go from their boy self to their, their, their alter ego character and their whole personality would just explode in my, I never had that. So I focused, I let the clothes do the exploding of the personality. The sleeves, are we starting low? I always say when I was 32, 33, I really started to like myself. Everything about me, I was got good with the skin color, the cleft palette, uh, how I sounded, how I looked. I was really, I just became comfortable in my own skin. I use Pride Fest to get that energy out, share that story of love, positivity, and acceptance. Love who you want to love. Love is love. That's what Pride is all about. I started emceeing because I was helping drag queens uh, who could never get ready on time. And eventually they said, why don't you just emcee the show? And I remember walking out there on my first Pride Fest. And that was 16 years ago. There weren't families back then. Uh, today I see people with their kids, literally holding a little kid's hand on their I don't remember families back then. It was a lot of, of predominantly I feel like there were more men in the audience that I was looking at, but there just weren't so many different looks of people and sizes and ages and colors and different. I mean, when I look in that audience now, it is a sea of youth. It's 
it shouldn't be hard to articulate, but it's, it's a beautiful, it, I didn't see that 15 years ago. It's a great day, we're about love, empowerment, and just expressing ourselves. I remember just a few short years ago, people, we were fighting for like marriage equality, and now we're here like in this gigantic event, and there's still so much more to fight for, but this makes me feel like we can get there. It gives me hope. It gives me a lot of hope for the way society is going and that we're more accepting and okay with everyone just being so open and who they want to be. People come to feel a certain way, to be out and to be with people who are like them and to feel a certain way. And so my Part of my goal is to add to that feeling. And then, and then, she won this show called RuPaul's Drag Race. Ladies and gentlemen, the incredible Amy Oppling! The winner of season 11 RuPaul Drag Race, Denver's own Eli Avi! Denver! Happy Pride! If anything, I just want this to be proof that if you live out and you live proud, you can accomplish amazing things. Best, best return home I've ever had. We started to see members of the Denver community like Evie Oddly, who grew up here and has become the ambassador of drag, um, performing uh, recently on RuPaul's Drag Race. So our national visibility as a center for drag and, and gender illusion performance started to increase dramatically. Give it up for Evie. RuPaul's Next Drag Superstar! They were using drag as a form of entertainment, but until it started to be policed and oppressed publicly, then it became activism. And after that oppression was released, then it became a cultural tradition. I feel very proud to be part of the drag scene here. We have a long way to go, don't get me wrong, but we're doing we're doing good things, we're doing big things, we're doing we're doing really great things in the city. My favorite part about being a drag queen is the fact that I get to meet people every single day. I get to talk to people, make people laugh. I love that I can, I have the power to change somebody's day. But that's the final product. I get to perform, I get to be somebody I'm not. It's like putting on a mask. You can be anything. I still like to do it. I'm getting too old to do it, but I still like to do it. It's not focusing on what's next. It's focusing on what's now. Um, what are you doing now that's making the difference so that the next will be better? If I don't take advantage and use the resources that are at my disposal to make a difference, you know, then shame on me. I'm a big believer in all politics are local, so for me as an LGB, you know, a gay Latino that lives in Denver, Colorado, you know, first and foremost, Denver and Colorado are my primary focus, and right now, it's a, it's a great place to live. I see these young kids today, and it, you couldn't always hold hands and walk down the street with ease, and my, my husband and I still don't do that. That's kind of new to us. If we're in New York and Chelsea in the right environment, yes, but I see it here in Denver, and we're just not in that he and I aren't in that headspace because we grew up in just a different time. And now those young folks are there and they're comfortable with themselves and they uh, have a, their own positive networks of, of growth and, and development and healing. Drag has several purposes. 
Drag is used for entertainment, drag is used for political activism, drag is used as philanthropy, drag is used as identity. Drag has benefited the Colorado LGBTQ community specifically because it has been the central driving force behind our community. The importance for me as a person hearing these stories is not just a simple matter of historical reference, but to liberate people who are younger and growing up, to know that this tradition has been around since the very beginning of Denver. My name is David Duffield, and I am Denver. My name is Jessica Lahore, and I am Denver. My name is Scotty Carlisle, and I am Denver. I am Anthony Aragon, I am Denver. My name is DiMarcio, and I am Denver. My name is Morgan Taylor, I am Denver. My name is Evie Audley, and I am Denver. <laughs>